This video is brought to you by Athletic Greens, a comprehensive all-in-one greens powder engineered to fill the nutritional gaps in your diet and support your body's nutritional needs across the four pillars of health. Gut health, immune support, energy, and recovery. It's packed with 75 vitamins and minerals and whole food sourced ingredients combining the perfect amounts of micronutrients, absorption, and taste to jumpstart your daily routine. You'd be hard pressed to find a more comprehensive powder slash supplement on the market. Now look, as you guys know, I'm not exactly a fitness YouTuber. You're probably not coming to me for squat tips or exercise tips or health tips, but I do like to try and eat at least somewhat right and take care of myself. And Aesthetic Greens is that comprehensive nutrition supplement that is just gonna fill the holes because while I always try, I don't always succeed. What you do is you take one scoop of the powder and you mix it with eight ounces of water. Here's what I made earlier. And you are more than covered for the day. It also tastes awesome. It looks weird and green, but it tastes amazing. Plus, it's gluten-free, dairy-free, paleo, vegan, the keto, low allergen, and low calorie. <laughs> it's also less than one gram of sugar, which is weird because it tastes kind of sweet. One of the things I like about it is it definitely hasn't replaced my morning coffee. I love morning coffee more than anything, but I don't know if it's all in my head, but when I have this along with that coffee, it just makes it feel like a more sustainable energy boost. Anyway, Athletic Greens are the perfect dietary support regimen. So if this sounds like the supplement you've been looking for, then you can grab your own immunity bundle. That's one year of vitamin D plus five individual travel packs. I have those here and these come for free with your first purchase. Go to athleticgreens.com forward slash mega projects. Again, a year's supply of vitamin D plus five free travel packs at athleticgreens.com forward slash mega projects. Or just click the link below and let's get into today's video. When a population grows really, really quickly, producing young at rapid rates and overall numbers skyrocket out of control, we know precisely how to describe the situation. We say that the thing, whatever it is, is breeding like rabbits to convey this idea of unchecked growth. For most of us, that concept is simply a metaphor we've got tucked away ready to use whenever we need it. When the metaphor itself becomes a real life issue though, then we can have big problems. Cut to Australia in the early 20th century, when quickly multiplying rabbits was anything but a metaphorical situation. Australia's rabbit infestation spiraled so out of control that the Public Works Department of Australia had to build huge fences to curb this activity. Now you might be thinking that gigantic thousands of kilometer long fences to keep adorable rabbits away might seem like an overreaction, but this is anything but. So let's talk about the realities of having far too many rabbits hopping around, eating our vegetation, and changing the local ecosystem. And well, then you decide. We'll start in the before times, when Australia's rabbit population was underwhelming. One newly settled English colonist took issue with that, and well, the rest is history. The first European rabbits came to Australia when the first Europeans did in the First Fleet. In May of 1787, 11 ships departed from England and headed to Australia to form the initial penal colony of New South Wales. That First Fleet consisted of a few civil officers and marines, a good quantity of supplies, and between 1,000 and 1,500 convicts. Somewhere on their boat, hidden in a corner, there must have been a small family of rabbits as well. New South Wales set up its new Southern Hemisphere life happily. So too did the stowaway rabbits. Rabbits. For about 80 years, humans and rabbits lived together in peace. In fact, the Australians caught and bred the rabbits for food. Occasionally, they used their tiny hides to line shoes or mittens. Judging by analyses of Australian colonial food remains, it wouldn't appear that the rabbits were especially numerous. By the 1820s, that began to change. One contemporary newspaper noted that the common rabbit is becoming so numerous that they are running about on some large estates by thousands. This seems overwhelming, but at the time, New South Wales wasn't yet concerned. One New South Wales resident was still remarking on the ideal conditions for breeding more rabbits in 1827, writing, Rabbits are bred around houses, but we have yet no wild ones in enclosures. Then, the idea of rabbits shortly taking over the continent might have seemed to us like the prospect of an angry horde of chihuahuas roaming the globe. It just didn't seem likely or, well, particularly problematic. In the 1840s, people were still breeding rabbits for food. Their numbers may have been starting to grow slowly. Records from New South Wales' courts show that rabbit theft was increasingly common. The main event, though, that triggered out-of-control rabbit growth happened in 1859.
So it's 1859. Property owner Thomas Austin, who has just moved to Australia, decided that he missed hunting. In England, he had often dedicated his weekends to shooting rabbits. He wasn't able to do this in his new home. So Thomas wrote to his nephew William back in England to send him a specified list of game. 12 grey rabbits, 5 hares, 72 partridges, and some sparrows. He wrote, The introduction of a few rabbits could do little harm and might provide a touch of home in addition to a spot of hunting. Unfortunately, William wasn't able to find enough grey rabbits to fulfill his uncle's order, so he sent over a larger number of domestic rabbits, hoping that it would make up the difference. It would seem, however, that Austin wasn't very good at hunting. The native population of Australian rabbits skyrocketed out of control by the mid-1860s. By 1866, a newspaper reported that some 50,000 rabbits had been killed by hunters which failed to make any dent in the rising population. So, how was this happening? Well, the rabbits were just multiple supplying like rabbits. European rabbits are known for producing large amounts of offspring. They can also start to reproduce when they're very young. They tend to have four litters per year, each with two to five kits. This results in a lot of rabbits very, very quickly. And here's the other thing. Australia was the perfect place for a rabbit population to explode. Australia has mild winters, which meant that rabbits could breed the entire year. The widespread farming happening at the time leveled forest and scrubland places, which would have been difficult for rabbits to nest in, into fields with low vegetation, which is a rabbit's paradise. Too much of anything, perhaps especially rabbits, is a problem. The havoc rabbits were wreaking on Australia's ecology was devastating. Now, how did they do this? Well, primarily through overgrazing and reducing the availability of natural resources for indigenous species. Rabbits reduced natural pasture vegetation first, and then ate away woody vegetation such as small shrubs and the bark of small trees. This decimated Australia's natural flora, upon which Australia's natural fauna was dependent. Rabbits also caused serious erosion problems. They ate away Australia's plants, which left the topsoil exposed. When winds swept across Australia's plains, followed by driving rains, the topsoil wore away. Though topsoil makes it very hard to regrow any of the vegetation lost to rabbits or promote any type of commercial agriculture, something Australia was trying very hard to do at this time. Farmers started to suffer huge problems as the number of rabbits continued to grow. They started building individual fences to ensure that the rabbits couldn't reach their personal crops. Farmers also dedicated a lot of time to destroying rabbit warrens or the underground tunnels that rabbits create through burrowing. By 1887, losses from rabbit damage compels the New South Wales government to offer £25,000, nearly £2 million in 2021, for any method of success not previously known in the colony for the effectual extermination of rabbits. The result of their investigation? Well, they'd noticed the success of the small fences and they decided let's just do that, but on a very grand scale. Now, this wasn't the first time that Australia had decided to build an absolutely massive fence. Before Australia's rabbit population spiraled out of control, the continent had a dingo problem. These wild dogs regularly attacked sheep and cattle stations, and in one year alone, they lost over 11,000 sheep due to dingo attacks. In 1885, Australia completed construction on a wire mesh fence to keep dingoes away from key sheep stations. Keeping half a continent of industrious dingoes out of these stations required a lot of fence. There are sheep and cattle stations in Australia that are larger than some small countries. The dingo fence is one of the longest structures in the world, stretching 5,614 kilometers or 3,400 and 88 miles. Now, the dingo fence had worked to an extent. Armed with this precedent, Australian construction workers broke grounds on a new rabbit-proof fence in 1901. Its primary goal was to keep rabbits out of Western Australia. The fence ended up being formed of three smaller fences combined, running for 2,023 miles or 3,256 kilometers. It took six years to build, and the cost per kilometer of fence was 250 Australian dollars or 19,000 Australian dollars in today's money. In 1907, at the time of the fence's completion, its longest stretch was 1,139 miles or 1,833 kilometers, and it was the longest unbroken fence in the world. 
Australia's rabbit fence was made out of many things. For the most part, it consisted of posts made out of local wood, such as salmon gum, tea tree, and mulga, spaced a few meters apart. In between each post was barbed wire or wire netting. When wood was scarce, construction workers used iron. They tried to minimize this, though, as iron is really heavy, and whenever they couldn't use what was locally on hand, the workers had to haul in materials from often hundreds of kilometers away by bullock, mule, or camel. As the project drew to a close in 1907, and it was primarily under the supervision of the Public Works Department of Western Australia, and one man in particular, Richard John Ankertel. Ankertel's workforce consisted of 120 men, 350 camels, 210 horses, and 41 donkeys. When the project transitioned from construction of the fence to maintaining the fence, a man named Alexander Crawford took over. Even though the fence was already built, Crawford's job was far from easy. In fact, maintaining the fence is when the troubles really started. Crawford employed four sub-inspectors, each of whom was responsible for 500 miles or 800 kilometers of fence. Under these four worked 25 boundary riders. These 30 men had a big job in front of them. Remember, this was the very early 20th century. We didn't have very many ways to reliably or quickly communicate long distance, and we certainly didn't have CCTV to provide remote monitoring. In order to make sure that the fence did its job, keeping huge numbers of insidious pests away from Australia's dwindling natural resources, people from Australia's Fence Protection Squad had to set eyes on the fence themselves. This meant that Crawford's team had to figure out a way to travel up and down 3,256 kilometers of fence pretty frequently. To do this, they experimented with several modes of transportation. They began with bicycles, but they found that this quickly wore out the maintenance workers. Quickly, the boundary riders upgraded their rides to camels. While this was much easier on their legs, it proved very difficult for their necks. The camels were taller than the rabbit fence, and peering downward to assess potential damage didn't really work for the boundary riders either. In 1910, the team leveled up their maintenance transportation again, purchasing a car to inspect the fence. But unfortunately, this didn't work either. The car's tires were just no match for the rugged, rocky, ever-changing Australian terrain. The tires were always punctured very easily. Eventually, the team settled on a novel idea. Each maintenance team got a sled consisting of a buckboard buggy tied to two camels. The makeshift vehicle carried two increasingly uncomfortable maintenance workers sand surfing alongside the rabbit fence for miles and miles in what must have been the bumpiest maintenance route of all time. Between their assistance as pack animals during the construction phase and their integral role pulling bark boards for maintenance, there are those who believe that it would have been impossible to build the fence without the use of camels. After the sub-inspectors and boundary riders had figured this all out, Crawford still had to complete his own job. His job was to eliminate in real time any rabbits that managed to breach the fence. In other words, he set out each morning to play a real-life high-stakes version of whack-a-mole. Unfortunately, the state of the fence made this necessary. In just the first year following completion of the fence, a large number of rabbit colonies were found and eliminated on the wrong side of the fence. The Australian rabbit fence was a major topic of cultural interest at the time, serving as the inspiration for many books and later movies. Comics and jokes lightly roasting the fence appeared in Australian newspapers quite often, with one highly circulating comic hinting that, well, of course the rabbits were finding ways to breach the fence. The critters were using it as a government-sponsored net for their games of rabbit tennis. <laughs> Hilarious joke from the past there. <laughs> Not. After a while, Crawford's team had to face the truth. The fence wasn't working as well as they'd hoped. Fences work really well in theory, but they must be regularly maintained. They're perfect for small-scale solutions, but over thousands of kilometers, constantly subject to weather conditions and extremely industrious pests, these walls just couldn't do a 100% effective job. Unfortunately, rabbits and their intensely packed breeding schedule demand 100% efficiency, eliminate 95%, and the remaining few will repopulate very quickly. There's also the idea that perhaps these fences were doomed to begin with, since building them took a very long time. Remember, all construction materials had to be brought to site by camelback. Rabbits were almost always able to bypass the line of the fence as it was being constructed, leading to equal numbers of rabbits on either side of the fence almost as soon as it was completed. One commenter put it this way, a best the long barrier fences merely delayed the spread of rabbits into new country. So, it was time to come up with a new plan. <laughs> 
A physical fence can break down, and particularly creative rabbits can burrow deep or leap through holes. In the 1950s, the government tried another solution. They teamed up with Australian scientists to release another wave of rabbits into the wild, but this group of rabbits leapt into the bushland, carrying the myoxma virus, a specific viral strain that only affects rabbits. This massive experiment was the first time scientists ever purposefully introduced a virus into the wild to eradicate an entire species. One Australian scientist said, thus inadvertently began one of the great experiments in natural selection conducted on a continental scale. The rabbits who were infected came down with a disease called myxomatosis. This condition quickly killed many rabbits. Then, perhaps due to how quickly they breed, the rabbits quickly became immune to the myxoma virus. So the scientists started to work on something else. That something else was rabbit hemorrhagic disease virus, or RHDV. In the 1980s, scientists began to use it cautiously in a very controlled manner to reduce the still rampaging rabbit population. RHDV is an RNA virus transmitted by flies. It kills rabbits 48 hours after initial infection. For a decade or so, the scientists saw slight but promising results. Then in 1995, the RHDV virus escaped a quarantine facility, seriously decimating the amount of rabbits in the wild. It was calculated that RHDV lowered rabbit numbers in Australia by 90%. However, rabbits that lived in areas where there weren't a lot of flies gradually began to develop a resistance to RHDV. Scientists began to realize that they were a pattern. Evolution and the incredibly fast breeding pattern of rabbits would make it very difficult for any rabbit-specific disease to wipe out the pests entirely before at least some of them became immune. So they turned to poison instead. Using aerial bait drops of a chemical called sodium fluoroacetate, scientists were able to kill off entire colonies of rabbits. Using carbon monoxide and phosphine, they were also able to fumigate underground rabbit warrens, instantly killing any rabbits who were breeding or burrowing inside. However, huge chemical drops over large sections of Australia's wildlife just wasn't good for the environment. Today, Australia's scientists have several solutions that they know sort of work, but we also know that without a perfect solution, rabbits will bounce back more quickly than we can get rid of them. Because there's really no such thing as a perfect solution to get rid of Australia's rabbits, yet, the current priorities focus a lot on pairing research, physical boundaries, and viral agents to get the best bang for rabbit-proofing buck. For example, current projects include studying, isolating, and producing more effective RHDV strains, identifying other biocontrol potentials that may work better with less of an ecological impact, such as possibly Leporid herpes virus 4, a virus that has recently swept across North America, killing many commercial and pet rabbits. Establishing lots of very local natural resource management groups staffed with passionate Australian citizens who have a deep knowledge of their surrounding terrain. Helping specific landowners build their own smaller, easier to maintain fences and equipping them with safe types of rabbit poison so that they can each protect their own parcels of land. Strategically working to support the populations of native rabbit predators such as feral cats and foxes. Locating and destroying rabbit warrens and burrows with poison and fire. It's a lot of stuff that's going on. And the big question is, has it been worth it? We're going on 120 years of often expensive and sometimes dangerous rabbit management, and we haven't yet arrived at a solution. Fortunately, researchers have been monitoring the benefits of the continent's efforts to curb the rabbit population. Even though they've not yet been 100% successful, there have been huge gains. For example, researchers have found that Australia's agricultural industry saw economic benefits totaling upwards of $43 billion from 1950 to 1995 just due to the use of myoxma virus. The advent of RHDV in 1995 and the use of biocontrols together saved Australia's agriculture another $14 billion through 2011. We can also see the environmental benefits of rabbit biocontrol. While we haven't been able to eliminate them over the entire continent, tiny wildlife preserves where 100% rabbit removal has been accomplished are even flourishing today. Australia's rabbit-proof fence may not have worked as well as the government hoped, but it still stands as a first line of defense in protecting Australia's vibrant ecosystems. For now, we watch and we wait, ready for success with a future less permeable fence, perhaps one reliant on strategic biocontrols and strong community action instead of just wire and wood. So I really hope you found that video interesting. If you did, please do smash that like button below. Don't forget to subscribe. And as always, thank you for watching.